and welcome. In 1965, Dick Giordano, an artist and editor at Charlton Comics, attempted a superhero lineup called the Charlton Action Heroes. This was a project intended to expand into the flourishing superhero market, which was an area of publishing the company seemed to avoid. Included in this lineup were Blue Beetle, Captain Atom, Peacemaker, Peter Cannon, and Judo Master. Not pictured, but also included in this lineup were Nightshade, a recurring character in Captain Atom, The Question, a backup feature in Blue Beetle, and Sarge Steel. This attempt to create a superhero line was short-lived. Ultimately, the Action Heroes comics didn't exceed sales expectations, and the publisher, who was indifferent to superheroes in the first place, cancelled the entire line of titles. With the exception of Peter Cannon, these action heroes languished in the Charlton stable of comic book properties. They would be used very infrequently over the next 15 years. Also during 1965, Archie Comics launched their own short-lived superhero group, the Mighty Crusaders. Like the action heroes, the Mighty Crusaders recycled pre-existing characters such as the Shield, the Black Hood, and the Comet, and put them all together in a team book. Again, this was a publisher who didn't ordinarily publish superhero adventures. Archie had carved a comfortable and highly profitable niche, publishing sanitary teen adventures. Much like the action heroes, this attempt to capitalize on the popularity of superheroes was brief. The Mighty Crusaders would only survive for seven issues before fading into obscurity. In 1983, DC purchased the rights to the Charlton Action Heroes. At that time, former Charlton editor Dick Giordano was now an editor at DC, and these characters were placed under his control. Reportedly, the publisher, Paul Levitz, purchased the action heroes as a gift for Giordano, knowing he had a fondness for these characters. Giordano believed these heroes were never given a proper opportunity to establish themselves, and they deserved another chance at success. Giordano subsequently proposed a variety of projects starring these characters like a weekly anthology, and a separate Charlton universe of titles. But all of these proposals were rejected. During this same period, Alan Moore had taken over and established himself on the DC horror title, Swamp Thing. The artist, Dave Gibbons, was regularly doing work for another DC title, Green Lantern. Both Moore and Gibbons had enjoyed working together on Future Shocks and Time Twisters for the British comic, 2000 AD. Subsequently, they discussed collaborating on a project for the North American publisher that was currently employing both of them, hopefully a project with some substance. They first proposed a Challengers of the Unknown miniseries and then a Martian Manhunter miniseries, both of which were rejected. However, DC was actively soliciting Moore's work, so they remained open to any future projects he may propose. There are two gently conflicting versions of how The Watchmen began. In one version, Dick Giordano asked Alan Moore to write a proposal using the Charlton Action Heroes. In the other version, Moore approached Giordano. It's difficult to discern which version is correct, since both are equally represented in interviews. Regardless, according to Giordano, circa 1984, Alan Moore sent in a proposal that would utilize these former Charlton characters. While Giordano thought the proposal was good, he decided it wasn't a proper fit for the characters. The proposed story would essentially destroy the characters and make them unusable. There was another complication. Pete Morrissey, the creator of Peter Cannon Thunderbolt, had retained the rights to that character in 1968. So this character, who was integral to the plot, was not available. It should be noted that DC believed otherwise, and they used Peter Cannon without permission, most notably in Crisis on Infinite Earths. They would later license the character from Morrissey. Moore suggests that DC was adverse to destroying these expensive characters. While somewhat true, it wasn't strictly due to the cost of acquiring these properties. According to Giordano, DC spent very little on them. $5,000 per character, in fact. It was Giordano himself who was opposed to allowing these recently claimed characters being used in a story that would make them worthless. Alan Moore's original, unformed concept, the one that inspired him to send in a proposal, was taking an inactive group of characters with previously established backgrounds and grounding them in reality, then see what effect these characters would have on the world stage. Furthermore, he wanted to unravel the public image of a superhero and expose the reality underneath the mystique. Initially, he thought of using the old Archie characters, the Mighty Crusaders, but the action heroes were a good substitute for this idea and they were available. 
In both examples, these were established characters in an established setting. These elements seemed integral to the original core idea. Conceptually speaking, this was not unfamiliar territory for Moore. He had done something similar with Marvel Man, Swamp Thing, and, to some degree, with Captain Britain. He recontextualized these characters and their history for a contemporary audience. He put them into grounded situations with actual consequences, and resolutions required far more than simply hitting the antagonist until they gave up. It was a very postmodern, deconstructive approach to the superhero genre, one that Moore had been successfully exploring for a few years. It occurred to Giordano that with recent changes in DC policy, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons would make significantly more money if they created original characters. Basically, creators using pre-existing characters receive 2% of the cover price of an issue once it's sold over 100,000 copies. However, creators of a character received 1% of the cover price for all copies sold. That was in addition to the royalties for writing and drawing the project. This may have been the incentive that moved the project forward instead of it being shelved, like the Challengers of the Unknown and the Martian Manhunter series. Although one can't discount the strength of the plot itself being the main motivating factor. Regardless, the project was approved, contingent on the characters being reinterpreted as original creations. Of course, using the action heroes as inspiration wasn't an issue since DC had control of these properties. Veteran editor Len Wein, who worked with Moore on Swamp Thing, was then assigned to oversee the completion of the series. Over a period of roughly seven months, both Moore and Gibbons worked on their respective tasks. The characters were changed and then designed. The elements were refined, and they discussed the overall story. During this period, Gibbons suggested using the iconic nine-panel grid. The inspiration behind this suggestion was to ensure Watchmen didn't look like other comic books. The ultimate effect was to guarantee the artwork didn't overshadow the story. Using a grid merged these two integral storytelling methods into a coherent, inseparable whole. As Gibbon said in an interview from 1987, if all the pictures were more or less the same size, you'd get the same effect that you'd get in a theater or at the cinema or even watching TV. Because the frame is always the same, you block it out. You don't notice it. Using the cover as the first panel and having the logo run along one side, as opposed to being along the top, was also an attempt to give Watchmen a unique presentation. It was thoroughly designed to look iconic and distinct. Within the revised proposal, the action heroes were completely altered. For the most part, they became the spiritual antecedents to the main characters of Watchmen. Only Dr. Manhattan and Ozymandias resembled their Charlton counterparts. Everyone else became a mixture of archetypes. As Dave Gibbons explained in 1986, we've got a superhuman character who got his powers from the Atom, a Batman type of character who's got the equivalent of a bat plane and a bat cave, a Mr. A or Question type of detective, a heroine like Black Canary or Phantom Lady who looks very nice in her leotards, and a military hero who's like Judge Dredd or Reuben Flagg or Nick Fury. With the character design and the outline approved, Moore and Gibbons began the actual work of writing and drawing the 12-issue series. Their work began in March of 1985, a full year before the series was scheduled to debut. Both creators wanted six issues complete before publication began to avoid any production delays. In the end, they only had four issues complete before the series debuted. The colorist, John Higgins, was also another suggestion by Gibbons. Gibbons had seen the work Higgins had done on Alan Moore's ABC Warriors story in the 1985-2000 AD annual, and he thought Higgins would be a good fit for Watchmen. Initially, Moore was hesitant about Higgins, believing his style wouldn't work for the aesthetic he had in mind. But after seeing samples, Moore changed his mind, and Higgins became the colorist for the project. In the beginning, Gibbons would receive complete scripts from Alan Moore. Over time, this turned into pages here and there, as both creators worked on other ongoing projects. It was a slow, meticulous process. Both Moore and Gibbons were completely invested in crafting a story that was the best they could produce within the genre. Notoriously, Moore produced exceptionally long scripts. The script for the first issue, which would have been used to produce a 26-page comic, was 110 pages in length. While his scripts contained an infinite amount of detail, Moore did also deviate into asides to Gibbons, and he included little notes about his thought process. 
In other words, he was very open and forthcoming with Gibbons about how he visualized a scene. Upon receiving the script and reading it, Gibbons would then highlight the main necessary details so he knew what was needed in each panel. From there, Gibbons created detailed thumbnails of each page with dialogue balloons roughed in. He spent a fair amount of time working out the specifics of the panel in these thumbnails, and once this was complete, he penciled the actual pages, carefully following the thumbnail sketches. Then he lettered and inked the pages. With the exception of the coloring, Gibbons controlled the artwork from beginning to end. During this whole process, Moore and Gibbons kept in touch. They offered suggestions to each other and talked about the specifics of the texture, atmosphere, and the recurring motifs. In essence, they edited one another. According to the editor, Len Wein, the reason Watchmen had additional story material was because it wasn't a comic that could be sold to advertisers. Presumably, this was due to it being a direct market title that wouldn't be available on newsstands. Of course, some pages would be put aside for a letter column, but that wouldn't exist until letters were received. Due to the production cycle, the earliest a letter column would occur was the fourth issue. Overall, that left an extra eight or nine pages per issue to fill. Ween suggested to Alan Moore that he use that space to fill in some backstory of the characters and the setting. This led to the Under the Hood excerpts in the first three issues. In essence, this was Ween's entire contribution to the Watchmen series. It was decided early in the process to forego the inclusion of a letters page. Instead, Moore continued to write backstory material. Again, this is another element that made Watchmen self-contained and distinct from other monthly comic books. In an interview in 2004, Ween admitted that he and Moore heavily disagreed over the ending to Watchmen. Ween claims Moore knew he was blatantly stealing from an Outer Limits episode, and Moore didn't care. Ween also believed Moore had enough talent to find a more original way to end the series. This disagreement is often cited as the reason Ween ultimately left after the seventh issue. But another portion of that decision was due to Ween having nothing to do. Moore and Gibbons were crafting a well-put-together story, and editorial input was, for the most part, simply unnecessary. The incoming editor, Barbara Kessel, essentially acted as a production manager for the remainder of the series. In total, from the first proposal to the final issue being published, Watchmen took roughly three years to finish. While there were a few delays between issues, these delays were quite minor. Upon publication, Watchmen was successful. How much of a success is debatable. This is due to sales records only being partially available. The best extrapolation is that Watchmen was consistently in the top 20 and periodically in the top 10 during its run. It was regularly outsold by the John Byrne relaunch of Superman and by the X-Men. So it did well, especially considering it cost twice the usual amount of a comic book, but it wasn't a runaway success. Again, this is based on extrapolation from partial sales data. Its validity is somewhat questionable. However, what wasn't debatable was the critical success. Notoriously, DC printed and sold button sets based on Watchmen. Due to their contractual agreement, Moore and Gibbons should have been consulted and, more to the point, compensated for this merchandise. However, they were not. DC claimed these buttons were a promotional item and not subject to profit sharing with the creators. Obviously, Moore and Gibbons disagreed. Eventually, this matter was settled, but it became the beginning point of Moore's disenchantment with the comic book industry. The only two official pieces of merchandise for Watchmen were a t-shirt and two modules for a role-playing game published by Mayfair Games, both of which had Moore and Gibbons' involvement and are considered part of the Watchmen canon. In 1987, before Watchmen concluded, the series was optioned for a movie. Alan Moore declined writing the script, but both he and Gibbons were supportive of the project. Over the next 25 years, the Watchmen movie would go through various script drafts as a variety of directors signed on and subsequently passed on making the movie. The general consensus being, it was impossible to condense the story into a two-hour feature film without making radical changes to the story. Over time, and as his opinion of the movie industry hardened, Alan Moore would completely distance himself from a Watchmen adaptation. For his part, Gibbons seemed cautiously supportive of the effort. In a move that was highly unusual at the time, a collected version of Watchmen was published immediately after the original publication of the series. This point has to be underscored. 
A collected version, or trade paperback as they were popularly known, was not the standard like it is nowadays. Generally speaking, comic book collectors favored the originals, not something that was considered a reprint. So publishers tended to avoid collecting a series because sales were not cost-effective in most cases. Regardless, over time, and when the medium became extremely popular during the very late 80s and early 90s, Watchmen gained momentum. It evolved from being one of the best superhero stories available into being one of the best examples of the medium. This was further strengthened by other works inspired by Watchmen, all of which fell short of the standards set by that series. Watchmen took on the mystique of being a singular piece of work that couldn't be replicated. After Watchmen concluded, both Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons stated numerous times there wouldn't be a Watchmen sequel. They did leave open the possibility they might do a Minutemen miniseries, or a Tales of the Black Freighter one-shot, or a miniseries about the time the comedian spent in Vietnam, although neither seemed overly interested in pursuing any of these projects. While Moore and Gibbons did technically own the Watchmen characters, they had also, in essence, given DC an open-ended license to those characters. Basically, due to this agreement, DC could use Rorschach in a Batman comic if they so desired, or do a Blue Beetle and Night Owl team-up comic, or whatever. Moore and Gibbons would always financially benefit from the characters' usage, but neither their approval nor their involvement was strictly necessary. If the Watchmen characters were unused for a period of one year, the publishing rights reverted to Moore and Gibbons, and they could do whatever they wanted with them. The impression given by both creators was they would be retired, so to speak. This usage of characters also pertained to the collected edition of Watchmen, which has remained in print since 1987. It should be mentioned, the Watchmen contract isn't publicly available, and the specific language contained within isn't publicly known. All that is known is the incomplete, brief details Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons have mentioned through the years. Unofficially, it was the publisher, Paul Levitz, who ensured the Watchmen characters weren't used outside of the original series. However, this is speculation and rumor, although it should be noted that the characters went unused in other comics during his tenure at DC. So, this rumor is either an amazing coincidence, or it appears to have some validity. When Levitt stepped down in 2009, DC transformed into DC Entertainment, and Jim Lee and Dan Didio took on the role as co-publishers. Three years later, in 2012, a series of prequels titled Before Watchmen was announced. Although prior to that announcement, DC attempted to negotiate with Alan Moore to get him to return to the Watchmen property. Regardless of what was offered, which, according to Moore, included the rights being finally returned to him, Moore refused to participate in any manner. Unsurprisingly, the new management at DC moved the project forward without him, since neither his consent nor his participation was legally necessary. Perhaps not coincidentally, 2009 was also the year the Watchmen movie finally debuted. During this period, DC was also floundering, trying to find a direction that would translate into solid, good sales. All titles were cancelled, and the new 52 initiative was launched in 2011. After an initial success, this attempted revitalization failed, leading to Flashpoint, Convergence, and Rebirth, all of which attempted to correct the terrible creative decisions recently made. All properties, such as characters used by Vertigo Comics, Wildstorm Studio, and ABC, were folded into the main DC universe. This reclamation of characters under one DC Entertainment banner also included Watchmen. This was teased in Rebirth, explored somewhat in the Button crossover, and then fully realized in the official Watchmen sequel, Doomsday Clock. Currently, as of 2020, that is the status of Watchmen. The characters are now integrated into the mainstream DC universe, or multiverse, as the case may be. In the end, Watchmen existed in its own rarefied bubble for 25 years. It was self-contained. It had no sequels or prequels and there were no attempts to capitalize on merchandising the property. It was what it was. And what it was, was a singular piece of work that exemplified the possibilities within the superhero genre and the comic book medium. It continued to exist and to thrive because of these unique qualities. One could argue it was in DC's best interest to prevent this piece of work from becoming yet another property that was indistinguishable from their other titles. Its self-contained nature made it unique and precious. As the rumor suggests, Paul Levitz recognized these properties in Watchmen and realized it was a piece of work that needed protection. Once he was gone, so was that protection. 
and, whether knowingly or not, DC eroded and diluted the uniqueness of Watchmen with unnecessary prequels, merchandise, and a sequel.